Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Bert Park, and you're listening to the SA Matters Radio Show with Rich Gassaway. The SA Matters mission is simple. They want to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 94 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from Enfield, Connecticut where I'm in town to deliver a Situational Awareness Matters program hosted by the Enfield Fire Chiefs Association. Enfield is served by five fire departments, or better stated, five fire districts. And they all get along with each other remarkably well. Imagine that. They train together, they have automatic aid agreements, they share policies, and they have some awesome equipment. Wow. Uh, Thank you to Ed Richards and all the chiefs of Enfield for the wonderful hospitality that you showed to me during my visit. In the feature segment today, we're going to discuss short-term memory and how situation awareness can be impacted when short-term memory is overloaded in emergency situations. But before we jump into our feature segment, I have a couple of announcements. We reached a milestone, and I'm really excited. I track the number of people who attend SA Matters Tour Stop programs and in January we surpassed the 50,000 mark for the number of first responders trained on the topics of situation awareness and high-risk decision-making. I'm feeling pretty darn good about that. Wow, 50,000. Who would have thought that when this tour started that more than 50,000 first responders would gather to learn about situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. I want to take a moment to tell you a story that I share occasionally at my programs. When I was doing my doctoral research on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making, I was absolutely stunned about what I was learning. I couldn't believe that I made it 25 years into my career and no one had ever taught me the things that I was now learning. How could that be? With all the incident command and strategy and tactics classes that I had taken, it seemed inconceivable that I would make it this far into my career and no one had ever taught me this stuff. Well, I was a couple years into my program uh, and I was learning these things and I, and I put them together as a class and I called the class decision-making under stress and I submitted it to be, uh, delivered at a conference and they accepted the proposal and I put this program together, which was about a two hour program. And I went to this conference and I got to the room early and the room was set up for like 300 people. And, uh, I set up my, um, computer and, you know, checked all my, um, audio visuals and the microphone and everything to make sure everything was working. Okay. And I was all set up and the time was coming for the program to start. And I had my back to the, to the, uh, audience or, you know, to where the chairs are. And I turned around and no one was there. No one empty. And then like two people came in and of course, you know where they sat in the very back row of this 300 person room. 
And, uh, and I thought, okay, um, I'm going to be doing this program for two people. And I thought to myself, why isn't anybody coming? Well, maybe they know all this already. What if they know all this already? What if I'm the only one who's been out of the loop? What if I'm the only one who doesn't know this stuff and everybody else already knows this stuff? So they're not going to come to the program. And I started to get all nervous and worried about this, that I had put together a program that no one was interested in. And and then a few more people came in and a few more people came in and all of a sudden the room started filling up and the room did fill up completely. And there were people lined along the walls and they were telling people, scoot over, raise your hand. If there's a chair near you, the room was completely filled and people lined along the walls. Now I was really afraid. Yeah, I went from afraid of nobody's going to come because they all know this to what I, boy, I hope I, you know, do okay. Cause, uh, you know, people can be very unforgiving. Um, especially that many people in a room, and I was I was really scared about the presentation. I was afraid that everybody in the room was going to already know this stuff. And, and I was going to be telling them things that they, they knew already. And uh, when I started into the program, though, I could see the anxiety on their faces. For some, I could see fear on their faces. And I knew right then that they didn't know what I was sharing with them, that they too were out of the loop. They were like me. And when the program was done, um, I was, um, you know, thanked everybody. And then I had to break my computer down and, and get out of the room. And they started to line up the middle aisle. And that line coming up the middle aisle was 20, at least 20 people long, wanting to come up and talk with me and share with me their experiences and, and their um, concerns that they had not learned this stuff anywhere along the way. And I, I had people that had obviously been in the fire service for a long time, you know, just looking at them, they were, they were, you know, not the kids of the fire service coming up to me and saying, where has this been my whole career? How come nobody ever taught me this stuff, man? I wish I knew this stuff 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I would have been a lot better at making my decisions. And I would have understood a whole lot more about what was happening to me when I'm operating under stress. And the feedback was just incredible. And it was there that I knew that this topic had a place in the fire service that people didn't know what they didn't know about situational awareness and high risk decision making. And from that, you know, obviously I was just a student in the PhD program, but once I finished and I did my original discoveries on the barriers that flaw situational awareness, I created four programs that, um, I'm very thankful have, um, just taken off and just been, uh, an amazing, an amazing ride for me. I, I just cannot thank people enough for the opportunities that I get to, to share this message. And on that note, I want to take a moment to thank the departments and the organizations that have hosted some recent situational awareness matters tour stop events. Your efforts to bring this valuable and powerful training on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making to the members of your department and your region are very much appreciated. Recently, I was at the Utah Winter Fire School in St. George, Utah, the Iosco County Fire Fighters Association in East Tawas, Michigan, the South Carolina Firefighters Association Improvement Conference in Columbia, South Carolina, the Enumclaw Fire Department in Enumclaw, Washington, hosted me not for a situational awareness program, but for a leadership roundtable with their officers. The Buckley Fire Department in Buckley, Washington, gave me the awesome honor of giving the keynote at their firefighter appreciation banquet. The Alaska Fire Chiefs Association Winter Conference in 
Juneau, Alaska. I did three programs for them in Juneau, and the hospitality was great. So thank you to Fire Chief Rich Etheridge from Capital City Fire and everybody who treated me so well during my visit to Juneau. And, of course, where I'm at now in Enfield, Connecticut, for the Enfield Fire Chiefs Association um, hosting this program. By the time this episode airs, I will have completed one more program for the Ellesmere Fire Department in Del Mar, New York. If you're interested in joining me for an upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop, um, coming up, I'm going to do a little mini tour of Minnesota. February 9th, I'm going to be at the Grand Rapids Fire Department in Minnesota. February 10th, the Eveleth Fire Department in Minnesota. February 11th, the Lutzen Fire Department in Minnesota. February 16th, the West Metro Fire Department in Minnesota. February 17th, the Wyndham Fire Department in Minnesota. February 18th, the Tracy Fire Department in Minnesota. So thanks to the Minnesota Fire Departments for the opportunity to present here in my home state. And uh, while I'm going to be in my car a lot, traveling around to all these destinations, you know, and those and those stops, there's probably, um, oh, looking at the list, I'd say at least 15 hours, maybe pushing closer to 20 hours of drive time uh, to get around to all those destinations. But uh, um, that beats time waiting in airports and flying on airplanes, so... That For that, I'm appreciative. February 25th, I will be at the Addison Fire Department in Texas. February 26th to 28th, the NSA Winter Conference in Austin, Texas. March 1, the Los Angeles County Fire Department Fire Officers Conference. March 3, the Howard County Fire Department in Maryland. March 4 and 5, the Toms River Fire Department in New Jersey. March 8th, the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute National Fire Service Staff and Command Program little shout out to Mifri and the staff and command program. This is my 15th consecutive year teaching at, for the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program. 15 consecutive years. Thank you, Steve Edwards and all the staff at Mifri, Jonathan Hart, the program director, King, Kingsley Poole, the now retired program director for all of your faith and confidence in me. Um, cause you are, you run a very, very solid program there at Mifri and the national fire service staff and command. And I'm so glad to be part of that. March 18th, the center for public safety excellence in Orlando. I'll be delivering the closing keynote at that conference. And thank you to the CPSE. Um, I've delivered probably six or seven consecutive years for the Center for Public Safety Excellence. This is my second time delivering a keynote address for that conference, so thank you for that. March 19th, I'll be doing a keynote presentation for the Minnesota State Fire School in Alexandria. March 21 through 25, I'll be delivering a Company Officer Development Institute program, developing company officers on leadership skills in Columbus, Indiana. March 22nd, I'll be doing a Situational Awareness Program for the Madison County LEPC in Indiana, March 26th to 27th, another company officer development institute program for in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and March 31, a situational awareness program for the community fire department in Houston, Texas. Whew, I better get on my running shoes. It's going to be a busy spring for the situational awareness matters tour. And for that... I am very, very thankful. If you're interested in attending an upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop, head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage that's labeled Upcoming Event Schedule. Here's hoping there'll be a tour stop near you and we'll get a chance to meet up. More than 500 agencies on four continents have hosted a Situational Awareness Matters tour stop event. Has your department? No? Don't wait till you have a near miss or a casualty event. If you're interested in hosting a Situational Awareness Matters tour stop in 2016 for your department or your association or your region, contact me through the essaymatters.com website. There's a contact me link there. 
and we'll get something set up for you. Here's a tip for how to host a program at a reduced cost. I schedule many what I call companion programs. These are programs on adjoining days to other programs. So if you see that I'm delivering a program within a couple of hours of your department and you think you might want to tag along as a companion, contact me. You can save as much as 20% off the program cost by being a companion to an existing program. Okay, you may recall from the start of the show that this is episode 94. That means we're going to hit another milestone coming up when we reach episode 100. In the podcasting world, that's a really big deal. Very few podcasters have the tenacity to keep podcasting after just a few episodes. One of the reasons for this is very little feedback comes back to the podcaster, so they really don't know if someone's listening or if anyone's getting any benefit from their show. It's extremely rare that anyone would take the time to go to the website and click on the contact me link and send some feedback about the show. But if you're compelled to, go on, do it. I'd love to hear from you. And I do, however, get a lot of feedback on the podcast at live events. And that feedback drives me to keep the content coming for you every week. Your feedback really does inspire me to work harder. Thank you to those who've taken the time to email me or to post something on the social media feeds about the podcast. If you want to know where you can find me on social media, just visit the SA Matters website. And there are tabs there for Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. You can also sign up to receive notifications every time a new blog or a new podcast is posted. You can also sign up for a free newsletter that I'll send you every month. Okay, final thing before we jump into the feature segment, discussing information overload. I want to take a moment to share a message from our sponsor, Midwest Fire, and their president, Sarah Atchison. Hi, I'm Sarah Atchison, owner of Midwest Fire Equipment and Repair. We are proud to sponsor Dr. Gassaway's Situational Awareness Matters podcast. We share a passion for saving lives and have been working with firefighters to customize cost-effective, multi-purpose fire trucks since 1987. Our trucks are engineered and built to serve you and your community for decades. In order to make the bid process as easy as possible for our customers, we are now listed as a contractor under HGAC BY. Please call us today to find out how we can streamline the purchasing process for you as a contractor with HGAC. Contact us at 800-344-2059 or visit us at MidwestFire.com. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Thank you, Sarah Atchison and the staff of Midwest Fire for your awesome commitment to improving first responder safety. I sincerely appreciate your support of my mission. And I should also take a moment to note that Midwest Fire, along with Hail Pumps, have signed on to sponsor three live tour event stops in Minnesota. Your generous support helps to bring this valuable message on firefighter safety to regions that might not otherwise be able to afford or host their own tour stop. So thank you for your support and commitment to safety. And now... For our feature segment, exploring how information overload can impact situational awareness. If you've spent some time reading through the articles on the Situational Awareness Matters website, or if you've attended one of my mental management of emergency programs, you know your brain is truly an amazing, yet fallible organ. That theme continues with today's podcast as I talk about your vulnerability to suffer from information and sensory overload when you're under stress. Your brain is awesome at capturing, processing, storing, and recalling information. But it does have its limitations. 
especially when it comes to memory under stress. There is a four-step process in developing memory. Encoding, storage, retrieval, and forgetting. This process is quite complex. Perhaps I'll dedicate a future podcast to walking our listeners through the complete process of memory formation. But for now, I'm going to focus on the first step, encoding. This episode explores the capacity of your brain to process sensory stimuli into short-term memory information stores. This is what in neuroscience they might call the working memory. Working memory. You have many kinds of memory. For the sake of this podcast, the two that I will compare are short-term or working memory or long-term memory. Think of working memory as being all those things currently on your mind at any given moment. Some of those things are events that have just occurred, sounds you've just heard, or temporary memories that have come down from long-term memory storage bins, residing momentarily on your short-term memory while you think about or talk about something. The amount of information that you can capture, store, process, and recall in your short-term memory is quite limited. About seven pieces of unrelated information, give or take two. But as you know, at an emergency scene, there is a treasure trove of information to be processed. Oftentimes, many more than seven pieces of information for sure. You may be contemplating how thankful you are that you have the ability to sort out the important information from the non-important information. Otherwise, you might find yourself in a tough spot. Well, I have some bad news for you. Research shows, and my classes have validated through exercises that I have conducted, that your brain is not very good at separating important from non-important information. What you forget. There are a variety of factors that contribute to if and how you process information. Among them are the complexity of the information, the number of senses used to process the information, the emotional connection to that information, the connection the information has to already existing long-term memories, the various senses being stimulated to process the information, and the sheer volume of information. It is the last on this list that I want to focus on. When you are faced with massive amounts of information slash sensory stimulation, your brain can struggle to keep up. As brain regions become overwhelmed, the process of taking in new information or new stimuli can diminish. A system-wide shutdown is not far from reality when it comes to how your brain responds to information overload. If this happens, your situational awareness becomes quite vulnerable. You may simply not see something or not hear something. And it's not because you're not looking and it's not because you're not listening. It's because your brain is shutting down on the input of new information. Even though the photons of light are entering your eyes and the sound waves are entering your ears, the processing centers in the brain may be too busy to take in new information. Essentially, the gates are closed and locked. The cue. 
Unfortunately, there is no process in the brain to cue information when it waits for its turn to be processed. If the information doesn't get in when it knocks on the door, oftentimes it simply leaves the cue and is lost forever. If the stimuli occurs in repetition, is meaning it's continually present in an audible or visual format, then there is a chance that when the door unlocks, the information then may be able to get in. What information gets in depends on the list that I articulated previously. It is possible for a piece of information to be perceived by the brain to be so important that it can, using my analogy, knock the door down and kick out whatever information the sensory processors are working on at that moment in time. When this happens, the information that is kicked out may never come back. And if that happens, the information that was booted out may essentially be forgotten. If you've ever been working on something or thinking about something and got interrupted, say with a phone call, you may have forgotten what you were doing when the phone rang. If you're lucky, a visual or audible prompt may guide you back to remembering what you were doing prior to the phone ringing. The same thing can happen at an emergency scene where the environment is full of audible and visual stimuli. When you're processing a lot of information, your brain can get overwhelmed. If this happens, it can stop processing new information and even let go of some existing information. This may cause you to miss seeing or hearing something really important, or it may cause you to forget something really important. If your sensory processing is interrupted by a new stimuli that your brain perceives to be more important, whatever your brain is processing at that moment may also be lost. The logical solution might be to avoid processing too much information. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, hardly. But there are some things that you can do to stay focused. Here are some suggestions. Understand in advance what are the most important pieces of information you need to know from the type of an emergency that you are dealing with. For example, when assessing a patient with a potential heart attack, the short list might include pulse, lung sounds, skin color, blood pressure, heart rhythm, and current medications. The fact that the person had their gallbladder out 20 years ago is not on the list of the short, uh, the short list of the most critical information needed. Understand in advance what are the lesser important pieces of information that you need to know when you're dealing with a particular type of an emergency and don't consume your precious cognitive resources on the lesser important list. For example, as I said with the medical one, the lesser important list might be the last meal, old surgeries unrelated to their current heart condition, a smoking or drinking history. Again, if you're talking with somebody who's having an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack, uh, the fact that they smoke is not going to have a critical impact on your immediate treatment of that person. Um, so that maybe falls to the list of good to know, but not urgent information to know. That's not to say that any of that information isn't valuable. It just may not be the most important for dealing with the urgency of whether this person's going to, say, die in the next five minutes or not. Using prompts to help manage information can be valuable as well. For example, a checklist for a house fire that helps identify the most important information that might be needed. 
including perhaps occupancy, construction, smoke and fire conditions, victim survivability profile. Each of these, in turn, might have subcategories that provide more prompts and reminders. Avoid distractions and interruptions. Each of these result from audible or visual stimulation that can be processed and understood and that can contribute to the whole overload issue. Radio discipline. There are two parts to this one. First, ensuring personnel are well trained and well disciplined for how to talk on the radio. What is important to say and how to say it concisely. All of this will reduce the amount of unnecessary audible stimuli to be processed. Second, it can be valuable for a commander to have someone else monitor the radio for them to ensure only the most important information is passed along to the decision maker, reducing the potential for audible stimuli overload. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned with others, please contact me by visiting the essaymatters.com site and clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the homepage. Think about this for a moment. The lessons learned from your near miss event could save the life of another first responder. That's pretty darn powerful. If you want to share your experience, contact me. If you haven't subscribed yet to the SA Matters radio podcast, please take a moment to go over to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and search for SA Matters Radio. SA Matters Radio. And while you're there, please consider leaving some feedback on the show. And if you like the show, give it a five star review. This is really important to me because it inspires me to work harder for you. A lot of time and effort goes into producing, recording, and editing a show and lining up guests. And your feedback lets me know that you appreciate the show. In case you haven't heard, I recently released the third book in the Situational Awareness Matters series. This book contains critical lessons for improving your situational awareness and your high-risk decision-making. If you want to get a copy, you can get a copy on the SA Matters website by going to the store link or through Amazon. If you know of a business that might be interested in supporting the Situational Awareness Matters mission with a sponsorship, I'm seeking a few select sponsors to help offset the cost of running the website, social media, podcast, YouTube channel, and the monthly newsletter so you can continue to get all this content for free. The website has enjoyed over a million visitors who have downloaded over 4 million pages of content. We post new blog articles every Friday. The Situational Awareness Matters newsletter is distributed to thousands of first responders monthly. The podcast that you're listening to has new episodes come out every Tuesday, and it has been downloaded over 85,000 times. So if you know of a business that would like to get their message in front of my visitors, subscribers, and supporters, ask them to contact me through the SA Matters website contact us link on the homepage. Here's hoping we can pick up an additional sponsor or two and be able to keep this great content coming to you for free. A huge thank you to Midwest Fire for renewing your commitment to our mission and signing on to sponsor the podcast for all of 2016. If you're not a member of the SA Matters community of learners yet, please consider joining. There are over 5,000 members connected here on the SA Matters community sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to train members to be critical thinkers and resilient problem solvers. The membership is free. Free. When you sign up, I'll send you a special report. Free that I've created for new members called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. Did I mention it's free? Yeah, it, it, in the case I missed it, it's, it's free. If you're not a member yet, head over to the SA Matters website, click on the red box on the right side of the homepage that says free membership. 
If you want to get connected on social media, on Twitter, you can follow at Rich Gassaway or at SA Matters on Twitter. The SA Matters Twitter community is heading towards 17,000 followers of our mission there. Thanks to everybody who follows on Twitter. You can get connected on Facebook by joining the private SA Matters Facebook page. It's free too. Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash SA Matters. There's an enticement to join the Facebook group. I have a coupon code in the private Facebook group for 50% off the new book. That'll save you 20 bucks. On LinkedIn, you can also find me by searching Rich Gassaway on LinkedIn. Well, that's it. Episode 94 is complete. Thank you again to our sponsor, Midwest Fire. Visit them, MidwestFire.com. Thank you to our live event hosts. And thank you, our listeners, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there. And may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.